Thank you very much, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here today. It's been a pleasure since five years ago when I first showed up at 48 Wall Street, a historic location. The bills and coins and artifacts upstairs are astounding, and they are world-class treasures, some one of a kind, some impossible to believe. What do I have to do with that? I'm a museum worker. Well, they asked me to show some of my things and demonstrate how I might make the study of American finance fun. And I did it, and I made them smile and laugh. And I have things in my collection that they don't have. They're not particularly valuable or rare, but I've looked at them very hard and learned from them, and I'm really proud that it caught traction here, and I'm, I'm now five years down the road. I'm a collector, born, bred. I'm trying to divest. It's not easy. Um, and so I brought my autograph album, and I hope you will give me your autographs today. Uh, autographs are very important to U.S. money. All the bills ever produced in this country have had signatures on them. The earliest ones, actual signatures, pen and ink. The newest one, the 100, has a quill pen and an inkwell depicted on it to refer to the importance of the signature. So please use this modern version of the quill pen. Make sure you can see the shiny side. And may I have your autograph, Chris, and everybody else, please. I've worked in museums since 1974 and specialize in using collections of everyday artifacts to encourage people's sense of wonderment and help build the lifelong love of learning. So I was happily surprised to receive a call from the museum's president. And I started teaching here with my collections of curious currency. Money is extremely complex. So what do I have to offer that many of you Wall Street experts don't already have in spades? Weird things, unusual things, quirky things. I first wanted to write a book about one of my collections in 1991. I have the Guinness World Record for the largest collection of restaurant menus, over 10,000 menus. And it has a lark, and it's fun. But 30-some years later, that collection is now at the University of Toronto Scarborough in their permanent special collections department at the library. And students from a dozen different departments in the school are studying and mapping and digging into what's smart and hidden inside an ordinary takeout menu. And so a quarter century after I wanted to write a book, I stand before you to read from my first book, a book about money at this hallowed Wall Street location, the site of the first Bank of New York. Thank you to the people of Princeton Architectural Press and my friends and colleagues here at the Museum of American Finance, a Smithsonian affiliate. I'm going to read two short excerpts, a slightly longer excerpt, share some artifacts from the book, take questions and comments, and then I'd be very happy to inscribe books if you would so ask. The first two excerpts are by way of explanation. What am I doing? Why would you write a book about mutilated, altered money? Why have I chosen to focus on the idiosyncrasies of mutilated money? Because compiling a set that can never be completed provides an endless source of new knowledge. Because it's a field largely unrestrained by financial considerations. Because I can set my own standards. Because mutilation, corrosion, and erosion can make new money seem as venerable as the most ancient. My collection also doubles as a self-enforced rainy day reserve. If it's beat up enough, I keep it. Mangled money collecting is not about the control prized by most collectors. It's about the future, about the unanticipatable surprise of finding new and different types of alterations. 
I see my collection as a cash that cannot be counted in standard ways. It's not about money. It's about what can be learned from money. Mr. Richard Buckley, the financial manager for my parents' business, was one of five brothers who all became accountants. He was also a serious numismatist who gave me wise collecting counsel and once a folder of Liberty Nichols. This folder right here. This was, to an eight or nine year old kid, ancient and rare. My eyes lit up, but Mr. Buckley assured me their fiscal value was low because of their poor condition. Still, this gift of disfigured coins from a traditional waxed shoelace kind of man has always captivated me. Each of the 16 coins is more than a century old. All are worn and smooth. The rare ones were not included. The 1906 five cent piece has black, brown, red, rust, and celadon colored corrosion. The 1909 example is blackened and scuffed in a unique manner. I imagine it caught under a buggy wheel, careening around cobblestones. This is chapter two in Sam I Trust, US Federal Banknote Errors. With apologies. <laughs> Most of the money comes out perfect. Uh, in 1995, I took a job with the gallery at Takashimaya, part of the New York City flagship of an international Japanese retail corporation that enjoyed $15 billion in sales that year. Designed by Philip Johnson, Takashimaya's elegant Fifth Avenue shop featured gold leaf ceilings in an east meets west atmosphere. Unfortunately, unlike the Japanese, Westerners aren't accustomed to buying art in department stores and the gallery foundered. When I announced my resignation, a friend from accounting stopped by to wish me well. I've got a present for you, he said, and I thought, how nice, until he added, give me 50 bucks. My sudden joy evaporated. Come on, Sam, I know I work in art and you're in finance, but anybody knows that's not a present. Sam was six feet four, a steely-eyed Albanian emigre. He must have been hired, at least in part, for this imposing physical presence. His job involved carrying cash, lots of it. Takashimaya, like other Japanese stores, did its best to provide change in clean, new currency to suggest that it was well prepared and deserving of customer confidence. Rare is the Tokyo shopkeeper who would press crumpled yen into the hand of a valued customer. It was Sam's responsibility to claim standing orders for thousands of new U.S. bills. He regularly carried large sums through the midtown streets to his desk, where he counted and placed stacks of crisp cash in Takashimaya's tills. Stunned by Sam's brass, I stared at him, and I reflected on our time as colleagues. He had never exhibited any cause for distrust, but was clearly enjoying making me squirm. I checked my wallet, $67, enough to meet his demand and still get lunch. I stared up at him one more time and forked over the 50. At the same time, Sam handed me a small stack of singles. Without counting the bills, I sensed I'd been had and bought. Look carefully, curator, he snarked, and that's when my eyes popped. And these are the 12 bills that I got from Sam. So it starts out a perfect bill, and then one missing quite a bit of ink. Little less, little less, little less, little less, and then back to perfect. Pretty cool. Or pretty bad for the person who was on the assembly line that day. I shot out of my chair and I shook Sam's big hand in thanks. 
He smiled broadly and explained how he'd discovered the 12 uncirculated, sequentially numbered bills after his weekly bank run, replaced them with his own money, and set the misprints aside. Lunch hour came and I headed out the door, not to eat, but to visit Stax, the vaunted numismatics firm in business since 1935. I met with a stony-eyed clerk who said, let's see what we've got here, pulled on cotton gloves, arrayed the bills on a velvet pad, and examined them through a jeweler's loop. My heart started to race. It wasn't long before I heard, I can offer you $500 right now. No, thank you, I replied with my best poker face. My Brooklyn-born mom had instilled in me a wariness of big city wilds, and alarms sounded in my head when I was offered 10 times what I'd paid. The next time I visited my hometown of Buffalo, I brought the misprinted money to local coin dealer Harold B. Rice, who followed the same numismatic ritual, white gloves, black velvet, fancy magnifier. Harold, whom I'd known and trusted since age five, said, hmm, and took quite a while before offering, I can give you $900 half. Uh, thanks, but no thanks, I replied, too stunned to part with my burgeoning windfall. Harold sold me archival sleeves, and I loaded up the insufficiently inked bills and placed them where they remain to this day in a vault. Well, actually, I'm going straight home, don't you worry. <laughs> so what are these 12 $1 bills really worth? If I bring them to a bank, I'll get 12 standard dollars in exchange. So why did Stax offer me $500, and Rice nearly double that? because there are many collectors who buy to add such government mistakes to their holdings. Collectors engaged in this alternative market develop heightened senses. They must be able to identify all types of mistakes, because there are even forgers who specialize in faking error currency. Controls for ensuring the precision of U.S. currency are world class and squadrons of determined inspectors operating high-tech machines safeguard the Bureau of Engraving and Printing's most important product. Each bill is supposed to weigh exactly one gram and measure 2.61 inches wide by 6.14 inches long by 0 0.0043 inches thick. Defective currency is destroyed and substitute bills with the same serial numbers are issued. These replacements are known as star notes I have one up here, you can come take a look later. There's a small star uh, right next to the serial number. So they issue the bill with the same serial number and add a star to serve as a, as a, a double check. Hundreds of steps are needed to create U.S. bills. In 2012, for example, more than 8 billion rectangles of the government's proprietary fabric soaked up close to 3,000 tons of ink to create just under $359 billion. Such large numbers mean that mistakes can and do slip into circulation. 